Very good. All right, turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians, please. The book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. We're still in chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. And we're trying to end up here. We should have ended up a while ago uh, with these shorter sessions. It makes it hard to move uh, move any faster. But it's God is the author of hope. We're looking at that good hope through grace. And if you look at that word good, it comes up a couple times. In verse 16, good hope. In verse 17, good word, good work. That's not a bad outline, is it? Good hope, good word, good work. <laughs> and uh, Paul is comforting and establishing them. And these are the words that surround that comforting and establishing. Um, Christ, or God, is the author of hope. Let's look in the book of Romans, chapter 15. The book of Romans, chapter 15. And in verse 13, it says, Now the God of hope fill you all with, fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have established that He is the God of hope. He's able to fill us with joy and peace based on faith. And we're exhorted to abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this hope is a powerful thing. That, uh, that expected, that confidence, that expectation, that confident expectation. Um, it is at the very core of faith. You, you cannot define faith without hope. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 8 tells us that we're saved by hope. Mm -hmm. uh, in Romans 5 we're told that hope maketh not ashamed. Mm -hmm. I find that when I'm dealing with millennials, I'm not sure I buy into all that, but... Okay, there's no hope. There's no Bible. And therefore you have a life that's given over to the present wickedness. Uh, it's uh, Life without hope. Life without Christ is a life without hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. You don't have Christ, what are you looking for? Where's your life going? Um, you're, you're back there in, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes, aren't you? Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to end up, right? Um, uh, let's look... I'm sorry? Maybe it'll come to the truth, though. I'll tell you, though, millennials are very open. They'll listen. Next generation wouldn't listen. They mocked. But a millennial will listen. He's taught to respect everything. That door swings both ways, but at least it swings this way. Uh, and uh, don't be afraid. To, all these young people, they know they'll respect. They'll respect it. They'll listen. I found that out. Uh, in Romans 8, 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with perseverance wait for it. Uh, it finds its, its expression uh, and endurance under trial. I look in Romans chapter 5, Wherefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have that gracious invitation by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope 
of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also knowing that tribulation worketh patience or perseverance. Perseverance, experience. And experience what? Hope. Hope. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. Hope maketh not ashamed. Um, you cannot have faith without hope. Now faith is the what? The conviction of things... Hoped for. Hmm? Yeah, you can't you can't define your faith without it. <laughs> um, its expression is found in the perseverant waiting and coming of Christ. Uh, look in First Thessalonians chapter one verse three. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and perseverance of hope. You'll find hope and perseverance right together there in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the Hebrews began to fail. They didn't have a recompense of reward. Uh, they lost sight of their hope. This is why we persevere. Perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. It is the anchor of the soul. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering how vital that might be or what the practical application is. Uh, you know that verse. Look in the book of Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 6. That by 2, verse 18. Hebrews 6, verse 18. That by 2 immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before, not a hope, the hope. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. The hope set before us, which we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, the Inner, the inner presence, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what that veil meant in the tabernacle. We'll be touching on that today in our communion service. Um, that, was, that, brought, that, that veil was there to separate the holy from the holy of holies. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the day of atonement once a year, the priest would enter in first with the blood for himself and then for the people. Um, that's the innermost place. Um, much appreciate its purifying power. Purifying power. Now look in 1 John. 1 John. Uh, I find this a great deterrent to sin. If we truly appreciate our hope, if we have that uh, confident expectation. We're looking for Him. Now when we talk about looking for Him, what exactly really are we talking about as believers? Alright, which coming? The meeting in the air. The meeting in the air. We call that the rapture. Alright, and by the word rapture is in the Bible. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's just the old and translators decided to do us a favor and translate it out for us. So if someone says, oh, it's not in the Bible. Yes, yes it is. It is there. Um, but nonetheless, uh, if, if we are looking for that blessed appear, that blessed hope and glorious appearance, when might he come? 
His coming is imminent, so how should we be living? All right. We should be living like he's coming today. How will he find you? Uh, that's the pure. That's how hope purifies. I mm-hmm. uh, look in First John chapter three. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we sh- when He shall appear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I try to imagine that. Of course, it's unimaginable. That's what makes it fun. But I, 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 people ask you, oh, when Jesus comes, what do you, oh, the pearly gates and the gold streets. And now it's like, it's, you won't be finding those things. But nonetheless, it's all of the things of heaven. My friends, that's not going to be the center of heaven. Uh, you know, oh, I'm going to meet with all of the apostles and talk with them. I'm going to do that. I want to do that. That's not the program of heaven. No. Program is, of heaven is holy worship and service forever. Mm-hmm. That's the program of heaven. Uh, the center of heaven is the temple and the light of heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. You're going to see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, what? Purifies, Purifies himself even as, as he is pure. Uh, you're sure going to look at sin differently if you're valuing your hope. I think that uh, sin can enter in easily when we lose grip of our hope. That's, that's a, a red flag. That we're not where we ought to be in our faith. When we are betraying our hope of living as if he's coming right now. He's coming today. Right? Uh, That would define every action. Um, I hate to use football examples, but sometimes it applies. And of all of the teams, the Irish... (laughs) But as they go out, before they go out their tunnel, there's, a, there's a, a little sign above the doorway. It says, play like a champion. And they have to smack that thing on the way up to remind them how they're supposed to go out there and do what they're supposed to do. Hope is like that for the believer. It defines your faith. It defines your practice. It's the anchor of your soul. Um, So we could go on and on. We we have a living hope. We have a living hope. Um, Look in the book of uh, 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, that's born again, regeneration, uh, unto a living, lively, quickening, if you want, hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You have a living hope. Uh, I know we talk about faith all the time, but you can't have that without hope. <laughs> it's the basis of our hope. What kind of faith would you have if there was, if you had, if the, if hope would be missing? So those are those are the things that we would want to look at, uh, and that's what Paul leaves them with: that good hope, that good word, that good work. Uh, that is to comfort and establish. And that's a lot, a lot better than the condition they were in. Shaken and panicky. 
<laughs> okay? So that's, what the, that's the remedy of the Apostle Paul. All right, let's go back, if you will now, please, to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Um, we, uh, Paul and his epistles will break out into a prayer just about anywhere, and he does here. And I do believe that that is part of what Paul is, uh, and in part of his remedy for these Thessalonians. Um, and you'll see that he engages them in prayer even for himself. And in verses, uh, our number one point, intercession, verses 1 through 5. Uh, commendation, verses 6 through 11. And also 12 to 15. And salvation, 16 to 18. Now, in 6 through 11 is part one. It's follow the tradition. And part two is 12 to 15, exhortation um, and admonition, admonishment. So let me go over that again. Um, I've divided the chapter three this way. Uh, Verses one through five, intercession. Uh, Verses 16 to 15, commendation. Part one, six through 11, follow the tradition. Part two, exhortation, admonition. Then thirdly, salvation from 16 to 18. Uh, Sometimes it's good to kind of see how things fall together and outline helps us do that. Uh, So let's see what else Paul has to write now. Finally, brethren, pray for us. Uh, he's, (laughs) he's, He's praying for them and he's exhorted them and he's dealt with this a problem, and he says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course, one, two, and be glorified even as it is with you, three, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all men have faith, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Now again, Paul is is um, he's still working with them here. He's still correct. He's still mentoring. Even with this prayer, he's mentoring them. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts unto the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. And we just defined that, didn't we? That's that good hope. So even in Paul's prayer, uh, he's also praying for them. All right, now we come to uh, commendation. Now we command you. So Paul first prays that they will do do the commands, and then he gives them the command. (laughs) Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the what? Tradition that received of us. All right. Now, what tradition are we talking about here? Is that the one where he's, he's working and not being in busy body? And okay. So what was the first tradition about? It was about what? Up in verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold fast the tradition. Tradition is something passed down. What did Paul just talk about that was passed down? Okay. You have to go back and look at what comes before. And because you have that therefore up there. See that therefore in verse 15? He's just spoken to them about their position in Christ Jesus. And before that he was straightening out about what? The mystery of iniquity that doth already work. So that tradition has to do with the doctrine. This tradition has to do with the practice. 
Okay? Now we're entering the practical. And he says, not after the tradition which he, which, he, which he received of us. Now, you don't go withdrawing from a brother over every little thing. That's not what Paul's, that's not what he's talking about. There was something handed down. And there were those that were walking what? Disorderly. He is identifying certain brethren. They're identified. They're walking disorderly as to what? Tradition, the the practical, handed down to them. Invariably, if you compromise on your doctrine, you will compromise on your practice. And vice versa. If you decide to live any old way you want to, rather than the tradition that you have been given, you'll compromise your doctrine. You'll have to make your... Bend your doctrine around your practice. And we see a lot of that going on today. Okay? But notice, for ye yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. Now, do you see, this is what I, I, I don't, this is where I disagree with these commentators making it all eschatology. Um, it isn't. Paul is mentoring them about what? Discipleship. Here's how you're to continue following. You see how he's, you see the, the point? Okay? For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So we have identified disorderly brothers according to that practical behavior that was handed down to them. Okay? Now we have here a uh, retrospect retrospect uh, how you ought to follow who us in other words we're continuing that that tradition we continue it neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we would not be chargeable to any of you does that sound familiar well, it should. It's right over here in the first epistle, isn't it? Isn't it over there in chapter 2? And in first, uh, nine, first Thessalonians 2, 9, for, we, for ye remember, brethren, how our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. Word for word. <laughs> and notice, we preached or proclaimed unto you the gospel of God. Um, may I say, and I've, I've brought this book to my pastor teachers in Africa, and I've stressed this way. It is not only what we do, but how we do it. How we do it is the application to the message of what we do. Understand? It matters. And because of the occurrence in Thessalonica, and because the, uh, you might say that the, the, the Paul and the apostles, the colleagues, took the high road. Okay? Instead of, uh, uh, instead of going and getting into a word fight with the accusers, they just went to work. They clocked in. Uh, be, why? Because of the gospel, the gospel's sake. Uh, shouldn't Paul have been um, uh, supported by these Thessalonians? Absolutely. It was his right. It was his authority as an apostle. Right? Uh, We had that discussion back in in Corinth, remember? Now, he wouldn't take anything from the Corinthians because they were carnal. Then the Corinthians turned around and said, well, because he didn't take anything from us, he's not an apostle. (laughs) You know, you can't win. (laughs) Yeah, so it kind of proved Paul right, didn't it? Now imagine if he would have taken something from them. Oh, Oh, yeah, okay. (laughs) There are just days you're not going to win. And that argument was a stupid one. He really made them look foolish, didn't he? Well, if there is ever uh, a sign of my apostleship, it's you. Duh. You know, (laughs) for pity's sake, right? Uh, Yeah, Paul could have. And you had those accusers. They wanted to hinder the entrance of that powerful gospel. 
And they were going to use that uh, as a way to say, see, Paul's just another paid charlatan. Watch out now, he's taking money from those Philippians. He's going to take, he's going to get in your wallet too before it's over, you know. Um, Paul said, by the way, we, we left a tradition to you. And he, but what, what's expressed is just as important. If you notice, he says, we, 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 with labor travail night and day. Why? Not be chargeable unto any of you. You can't make that accusation. Possible. Uh, the, the Thessalonica believer could not say, the Thessalonian believer couldn't say, yeah, we got the gospel from Paul, but whoo, that was costly. <laughs> no, no, they couldn't say that. See? Uh, those accusations, they're done away with. And notice in verse 9, but because we have not power but to make ourselves an example unto you to... This is about following the apostles. This is about following Paul, Luke, Silas, Timothy. We left you something. We've handed something down to you here, and you need to be following it. Why is there trouble in this church? There was a moment, bing, where they decided uh, that they weren't going to believe what they were taught. And they listened and they gave ear to the nonsense of the Judaizers with false epistles and secret meetings and, and uh, special words and all of that. Somewhere they decided to do that. Somewhere, some of them in the, in the Thessalonican church decided they were not going to work they were going to get out the old hammock and iced tea and just wait for the immediate return of Jesus Christ. And of course, idle hands are the devil's workshop. <laughs> they became idle, they got bored, and if you're, not doing, if you're not taking care of your own business, you will go and try to take care of somebody else's invariably. Right? Uh, and notice, not because we have not power. Now verse 10, for even when we were with you, this we, what? Commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's pretty strict, isn't it? That's pretty strict. Uh, for we hear, uh-oh, here we go. For we hear that there are some, now it wasn't the whole church that was carried away, by the way, who walk among you, there's that word for the third time, Three times here so far we have that word. Disorderly. Now we get it clarified. We have it identified at the beginning. Now we get it clarified here. Working not at all, but our busybodies. Now keep that in mind. These were capable of working and decided not to. Now the blue. They were capable. They had the wherewithal to be busy. And they were in everybody else's business. Mm -hmm. That was the problem. <laughs> they were busy, but not where they needed to be. Okay? And that's what walking disorderly means here. So please don't apply this to some other application that it doesn't belong to. That's disorderly. I've seen people do that. Well, hey, if you don't work and you don't do this, uh, you're no good. That's not what Paul said. That's not what this teaches. These were capable of working. They were at one time. They had a moment. You know? And notice, but them that are such, we command. Now, that's the third time that's said. Command, command, command. Accommodation. Accommodation. And exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. <laughs> They're not making a big noise. 
Um, you know, supervisors really like those guys that do that. <laughs> Along the line, I remember when I was up at PPG in Delaware, and I had a, a big fella, and he was none too handsome, okay? And he was about six foot six, big fella. And uh, he, he didn't say anything. But boy, I would go over there and he'd get his work done. And it was done quiet. <laughs> no noise. He'd just come to work. He'd sit in front of me. He wouldn't even open his mouth. He sat in front of me to get instructions. I'd tell him, okay, now Bob, this is what we need to do this week and this is what you need to concentrate on. We need to make this better. I'd get a little grunt. Hmm? Out the door he'd go. Wouldn't see him for the rest of the day. Uh, go check on it. Done, done, done. Come in, clock out, go home. Quiet. No trouble. <laughs> uh, that's what Paul, that's what he's talking about. He's saying quietness, they work. And eat their own bread. Quiet. Uh, did you ever see somebody makes a big noise every time they do something? Well, look at me, I did this. We've had that in this church in the past. I'm sorry to say. Well, who are you really serving then? Now, I have to question that. Who are you serving? But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now, that is, a, um, that is kind of like an inoculation. That's encouraging the workers. That's for the workers. Be not, be not, um, but, but brethren, be not weary. Don't faint. Don't be faint of heart in well-doing. Uh, for if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him, that he may be what? Now, are you doing it to be malicious and vindictive? No, watch out what kind of attitude that's done with. See, I've seen people take this in a righteous vindictiveness, and may I say, there's no room for that in the body of Christ. Okay? Never. Not with any sin. Uh, because what are, we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to win the brother from the sin. Now, if we meet sin with vindictiveness... We're, we're just another big problem for that sinner. <laughs> That's all that happens. We become another big problem. You understand? Yeah. Now, we're called to do this in several places in the Bible. One of them is in the book of 1 Corinthians, isn't it? Where you have fornication and they were puffed up and proud about it. And, and what did God, what did Paul say? No, we're not to have company with that. Right? He's to be put outside. We've tried to discipline that. Uh, he's not going to come back. He's going to stay in his sin. Well, you're not to hobnob around with that. See? Uh, here, uh, it's that they might be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Therefore, commendation part two is what? Admonishment. Admonishment. Now, verses 16 to 18. About all I'm going to be able to do is open this. Now, time word. Okay, now you shift gears. Okay, we've, we've talked about intercessing back and forth. Them for Paul, Paul for them. Accommodation. Hold the tradition, follow tradition. Two, exhortation, admonition. Do you see it? All right, next. Now. The God of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand. <laughs> so we don't get mixed up the false epistles with the true ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is the token in every epistle so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So next time we get together we'll begin with Chapter 3, Intercession. And then we'll be looking at these commendations. All right. As we conclude, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer.